nice, clear, but cool weather. <laughs> but uh, we're not here to talk about the weather. Let's look to the Lord this morning. Uh, there's a, a Justin, Veronica's brother is in uh, bad shape, and uh, I think they only given him, what, three months to live? Pretty well. Uh, his nephew. It's okay. Thank you. But anyway, uh, I know the Lord is able, but we have to put that in the Lord's hand, and we can lift him up in prayer. Yes. Not only him, but also Veronica and their family as well. Brother John Crowther is still in the hospital, and so is my mother. There's many needs, and uh, maybe others this morning has needs. Leon, remember Leon, yes. And Jana. And Jana, okay. And Roger? Okay. All right, let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace, we thank the Lord that we can approach thee, Lord, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, you see the many requests that are, Lord, brought before thee. I know, Lord, that you knew them before we even asked, but, Lord, we are asking, Lord, as a people that you would meet these needs, Lord, that you'd move on their behalf. Lord, we have come here this morning to praise and worship thee, Lord. And, Lord, we ask at this time also that you remember thy nation, Israel. And now, Lord, we are ever so thankful, Lord, that you have called us, Lord, and brought us into higher heights and deeper depths in the hour that we live in. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We see it this morning. Have the song leader come lead us in the song service. <clears throat> See everybody that made it out in this nice weather. Takes a while to get warmed up, get moving. Thank you, Lord. Just a little longer, and a trump of God will sound. could do number 33 in the red book here. Sinners 
this morning maybe you can do number 32 in the blue book page I think it's page 19 time is filled with swift transition not over unmoved can stand
have fallen, my soul cast down, but mercy rewrote my life. Mercy rewrote my life. Mercy. So
45 in the blue book.
of the Lord is in this place. Thank you, Lord.
and then the other side. Thank you, Lord. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus sees it all, he knows about your struggles, even before you call, he sees you when you're broken, every time you fall down, so don't give up, keep holding on, you're standing on solid ground, cause he Taking care of you and me in ways, ways that we cannot see. He's working things for our good, just like he said he would. And he's taking care of you and me. He said there would be valleys and mountains be climbed but he told us just take courage he promised peace of mind so as we journey onward getting closer to our goals we'll put our trust in jesus christ he will take us home oh yes he oh yes he's taken care of valleys and mountains to be climbed but he told us just take courage and he promised peace of mind so as we journey onward getting closer to our goal we'll put our trust in jesus christ he's gonna take us home Mike, you have a song this morning.
but he will do it. That I know for sure. I'm not crazy in this morning. Just a touch of the hand of the precious Jesus Dipped into the oil of the Holy Ghost It will soothe all your fears Wipe away all your tears It's the
Everybody happy? Presence as well, and as Sister Jean was talking about being still before the Lord, it just reminded me of a message that I heard a brother was speaking about. If we can be still enough, he will talk to us. And he made reference of a, a man that when he was a boy, he came home from school and his mother wasn't there to meet with him. And uh, he just waited on the porch area. And uh, the Lord told him that his mother was in an accident and she wouldn't be home right away, but she would be okay. And after his father pulled in the yard and he told about how his mother had been in an accident and the, his son said that he already knew and I'm just so thankful that we serve a God that can speak to us if we are still enough and I just pray that I can. Sometimes we say we have a hard time to sit down, we have to do things in a natural but sometimes our mind may be the same way. And, I just pray that you'll make me more sensitive to his spirit. And uh, can we just sing that little chorus, Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. us all the way to Norway. I never thought I would go so far away. I want to thank the Lord for everything he has done to us on that way. It's a long, long way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise 
everybody's content and happy that's good we'll have brother fred come and bring us the word i think it's brother fred this morning brother fred this morning yeah.
stand again. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can have a place we can assemble, Lord, in the country, Lord, that we can have peace. But, Lord, it's more important, Lord, that your word would have preeminence in the hour that we live in. So I ask it now in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Can we see it this morning? Leon told me that uh, the Pope was trying to change the Lord's Prayer. That it doesn't mean exactly what it is, so you probably all heard that to begin with. But it just goes to show they, uh, they need to change things to, so everybody can be compatible in among the religious world that they're all getting together now. Head office is, but not so much the actual assemblies themselves with the people in the, in the pews. But it's fulfilling God's word. We're moving towards a, a period of time where God's word is going to come to a completion. And here we are in 2018. I remember when I first started out. Well, I knew 1977 wasn't right because I only came in in 74, so... But then there was all the big talk about 2000 and year 2000, how things were going to happen. And, and then along, we were kind of looking for 2004, but that was back in the 90s, uh, in the early 90s, before time would progress to such a place. But God's word continually moves on. When we're looking at Revelation, It's one thing to say this is a revelation, but somewhere things on ground has to meet what the revelation is saying, unless we have to readjust the revelation that we are carrying. And so I believe God keeps us up to date. We're living in the time of the fivefold ministry. And what an hour are we living in now? We thought, I remember when uh, back in, in the 90s and the beginning of year 2000, well, I thought, wow, you know, things are getting close. But we find over time that God keeps adjusting certain things, watching for his coming. And that's very important in the hour because it's important to him that we live in. And I thought of going over again this morning about Matthew chapter 25. You can turn to your Bibles in Matthew chapter 25. I'm not going to go through the whole parables in details. But just to bring up to date that Matthew 25 really, there's some updates that because of the time we're living in, that God has brought some things that we see certain aspects more clearly than before. How many seen that before? Encyclopedia Britannica. It holds a whole lot of knowledge. I remember when we were young kids, we didn't live too close to the city, but teachers were always trying to get you to, to do some searching to get some things. And back then, no, they didn't have the Internet. They didn't have you could text anything on the phone and find what you want at your fingertips just like that. And so as we were, we were a family of 10 and we were growing up and 
So my father got this Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, there was 29 volumes to the thing, so there's quite a bit of information. Now, the reason I'm bringing this in to begin with is when we look at Matthew chapter 25, it's a parable. And this parable is describing over a hundred years period of time. And if we were to take every and bring and take that parable and to do it justice in the sense that we want to bring every detail, you'd almost have as many books as an encyclopedia of particular events that took place over the, sc the score of time of a hundred years. And it's wonderful to know, but how many remember a lot of things in the details? And that's why I believe when the Lord spoke this parable in Matthew chapter 25, had God shown him the future, he could have wrote volumes of books about it. But he gave a summary or a profile of this last 100 and, well, almost 120 years now or so. And you have to look at it from a point of view of God's interest. He wasn't worried about every detail, every person, what this one said, and, that, and so forth. He was looking at a condition that's on the earth. And as God would look down on the conditions of the earth, he's summarizing, using not the words that people were actually were saying on the ground, but summarizing the condition that would take place during that full 100 years of time. And so therefore then when we read Matthew chapter 25, it's looking at the spiritual condition that affects people during that period of time. To begin with, and when we start in, when he said, then the, shall the kingdom of heaven, that means then the grace age. Now the kingdom of heaven is not up in glory, but it's in the grace age where the gospel is being presented. So it's a period of time. He didn't say, well, here the kingdom of heaven is so many years. No, he's just making a general statement. And the kingdom of heaven be likened unto virgins that took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now he's showing, he's using those words to show an example of what took place on the earth. First of all, these virgins that took oil in their lamp, we know that's the Holy Ghost message or the anointing of God, the oil message that was brought in the 1900s, which caused the people saying, we must be getting back to what the Lord spoke about because we're having the same thing happening what happened in the early part of the book of Acts. We're speaking in tongue, we're receiving the Holy Ghost. And so in their mind, they're thinking, well, the Lord, where's the Lord in all this? We must, must be nearing something. But they had no time frame. They had no deep revelation to show them where they're at. But it wasn't necessary because God just wanted to wake up a people. And he wants to show that he woke up two types of people, foolish virgins and wise virgins. And the two were intermingled together all along those earlier years. Then it goes on to say, And they that were foolish took their lamps, verse 3, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oils in their vessel with their lamp. Now while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. They were expecting the Lord to come in their day because of the Holy Ghost that was Poured out on the Zuzu Street and different things. God, yes, He restored the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and He brought forth the oneness rather than the Trinity. That was in the early years of, well, from 1903 to 1912 and so forth. You can check this history out 
Google it or in the contenders or wherever you can. We have that our, at our fingertip. You don't have to go to Encyclopedia Britannica, flip through the pages, take maybe two days where to find it, and then get the information. So while they slumber and slept, what caused them to slumber and slept? Now there is something that we need to take note of. When God moves something fresh on ground, it's the freshness that keeps the life of the believer going. And God was testing that earlier time at the turn of the century from 1903 to 1927, whatever the case may be, they were on fire because of a new fresh message. And God wanted to see what they would do, but as they were looking at this new message, the men started to get into the picture and we got to protect this. You don't need to protect what God's doing. He knows what he's doing. And so, over time, that excitement they had in their earlier years abates. Had they been looking, really had they been looking in the right way, in that first love when that fresh revelation came, I imagine God would have continued on. But the condition we know that it had to turn out that way is there as an example to you and I. So when no more fresh revelation comes in, then there's less caring. People dry up. Oh no, we don't dry up. We so and so preach a nice message, and yes, you somebody can bring something exciting on something that was already brought. But that only that's not the same thing as fresh meat. Because fresh meat causes a stir in the Hearts of the believer that they, they want more. They're alive. They're not excited for just one service. All right. So in those years, after when the oil message sort of abated, and God allowed it that way, they slumbered and slept. They slumbered and slept on what? Did they throw away the revelation they had? What God had brought them, did that throw that out the door? They slumbered and slept on the Lord's coming, wanting to know more. They just stayed, and what we sometimes refer to, they, they start going in circles. They form denominations. But then, as we go down in verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The key thing to focus on, yes, there's the cry. But in what way does the cry become, it's the part that would initiate something of a stir. But in that stir, it says the bridegroom cometh. Now, I'm not the best one in grammar. You all know that. But means cometh. He means he's in the process of coming. He didn't say he was here. He's in the process of coming. And so therefore this, the cry, and we... Look at what point in history that the cry would start. Well, that started in 1947 when God brought a prophet on the scene. But before God that brings that prophet on the scene, he was preparing that servant of his from 1933 when he baptized on the river, the seven visions that he had, so forth. It took time for God to establish that prophet to be on the scene. But then when he comes on the scene, his function is to turn back the hearts of the children to the forefathers, which is the apostles' doctrine. Now, that verse 6, 
And it's not done in two or three years of time. That takes from 1948 to almost 1960 or, or 57, whichever. Because God, is, you can't just put exact date on it. It's how the doctrines of the apostle was being restored gradually over time, little by little. Kept getting more and more. And what is this for? Why would God say the cry is to the bridegroom is coming? Those principles of the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ was to prepare a people to have certain revelation in them. So when he does come, they are ready to that point and they're not a babe in Christ when the next step we're going to look at, when he actually comes himself. Now, when we say the bridegroom cometh, he doesn't come physically. He comes in the revelation of his word. So as the word is being restored, we're moving on down in time now till we reach 1960. So the part of the cry is to prepare a people to receive the next stage of that revelated word that would come down. It's restorative. Now, I... The reason I put that up is just to show these numbers that are behind the word cry and cometh. It's, how many is familiar with the strong concordance? The big blue book, about that big, gives the definition of all the words. And so therefore, when he made a cry means he's crying out something, a cry gets somebody's attention. And so, therefore, we can see that these are the, if you want to, the Greek words. That's to say it's a cry, a climber, or so forth. And, and, and that's fine to say there's a cry, but it has to be something that would affect the religious world. Not just someone getting up on one Sunday and preaching a sermon, but his message would now be like shaking the denominational world. In this cry, God was sending it not only with restoring the word, but he was also bringing some, the gifts into demonstration that would draw people. Because sometimes it takes that to draw certain people, and then God will bring them in and, fee and start feeding them to get ready for the Lord to come. But now remember, verse 6, he's coming. He's not here yet. But then when we, now I don't want to get into verse 7 and 8, talks about the lamp, the, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. But when we get to verse 10, now that a people has a fundamental foundation to be ready to receive the Lord, when we come to, verse, to ver, chapter 25, verse 10, it says, And while they went to buy... Who's they that went to buy? These are your foolish virgins. When did the foolish virgins decide to go to buy? Oh, wrong one. The foolish virgin didn't go buying in the early 1900s. Nor in 1947. Nor during while the cry was taking place. But it's because of the net of the, and the, how God drew and the miracles that was taking place. We have to understand what is a foolish virgin to begin with. He's saved. No, he doesn't have the new birth like we have. But I'll put it this way. The best definition that I can give... He believes in the blood of Jesus Christ. And whoever believes in the blood of Jesus Christ, it is counted for righteousness. 
And so therefore on that basis does the foolish virgins will have eternal life. But they don't move on into the rest. And if you want to the identification of a foolish, he's always looking for oil, anointing, meetings, things taking place in that realm. And so by the time you are now moving from near the late 50s, as the Holy Ghost was more or less abating as far as the big move that was in the net, because the net was co coming near to it, its completion, almost it had accomplished its purpose. But these fully virgin, I want more. I don't care what you preach the word, but where's the speaking in tongues? Where's the, where is, is the uh, dancing in the spirit? Where is all these things? And so therefore they couldn't see it in the messengers in Brother Brown's meetings. And so they go at the same time. God allows that charismatic to realm to, to start to fall on ground where there, other churches were speaking in tongues and the gifts were moving. So there they go. The foolish virgin will never argue with a bride person. He's just looking for oil. He's not going to argue revelation with you. A tear will, but not a foolish. So there they go. Now you're in from 1960 to 1963. This not happen overnight. Now as they're going to where the anointing meetings are going, while that's taking place, when we arrive to verse 10, and while they went to buy, so it's at that time, not in 1948, but now you're in the 60s. And while they went to buy, during that process of them going, now they just didn't go from 1960 to 1963, they kept on going. But it shows where the process started. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came at that time. Now what happened? What did the bridegroom come? And they that were ready, ready by what? By those doctrines of the apostle that the cry was, had brought to them. That's what made them ready to go in because why, why, they're ready for what? They had salvation. If there were a wide version there, they were saved. But they weren't ready for divine fresh revelation that the Lord was going to bring now. They had to come up to that level in order to receive the new things that God was going to be doing from 1963 onward. Now why 1963? For the first time since 96 AD, God uses a prophet to bring a fresh divine revelation. Six seals was open. And that's to portray now the word or the spirit of God has moved from a restoring aspect under the cry. Now he's moving into a revelatory part. So he says, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Now remember, he, now some say the cry and the shout is the same thing. Did the Lord come in 1947? Huh? Did the fully virgin go uh, buy oil in 1947? You know that's not there. But because Brother Jackson says the, the cry and the shout is the same thing. They put everything in the same bag. It is the same spirit. But you can see a progress of what God's working on ground is not quite the same. Here he's restoring in from 47 to 1960. He's restoring the apostles' doctrines. It was necessary for them to be go into the next stage so that they could receive fresh meat. All right. In now the cry, the shout. You'll find that in Thessalonians. Can you see it up there? Yeah. Okay. The Lord Himself. Why does it say Himself? 
It makes a distinction. He's not coming with a cry. He's going to be descending. From where? From heaven. Descending. He's not in the process of descending. He's coming. And from glory, it don't take twice 24 hours for him to come down in his revelated word concerning now what we call the shout. He's descending from heaven with a shout. We're still in that shout phase. We know up ahead when the seven seals broke, it's going to be the voice of the archangel. And the trump of God, that is the, that's actually when the silence is over, that trump of God is sounded, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, we alive and remaining are going up together with, it, with them. Now what I want to bring in is this. To say that it is the same, it is the same Spirit of God. Now, if you're listening on the Internet, it is the same Spirit of God that came in the cry. But it, now he's moved into what's called the shout part. And when we look at the shout in the concordance, it talks about it is he's coming with a command. It The word for for a shout is not the same definition as a cry, because here's the word down here, uh, over here. Oh, maybe I've got to bring it up; it's too low for you. The word shout, which is 2752, 2752 is spelt this way. In the Greek word, it implies he's coming with an order or a command. Well, when we look at Matthew 25, verse 10, he's coming with that shout with a command. A command to what? Go in that door. It's not a command, come out to meet me. He's talking about a command, and we know that that command, that the, according to Matthew chapter 25, Verse 10, and then when they came to buy, the bridegroom came, but he came with a command. It is still the Spirit of God. If you want to equate the shout and the cry being the same thing and mixing everything up in the bag and everything is all happening right from the shout started, and it does not. There is restoring to get the people ready. Now when he does physically come from 48 to 1960, He's coming. He's coming. Get ready to, for him to come. But when he actually comes in 1963, now he caves the command. What is that command? Go into that room. Did he force the bride? The bride said, hey, I'm telling you, you've got to go in that room. No. The word was strong enough with his, the command of his word was strong enough that the, that the wise now went into this room to be revelated. Oh, how wonderful those things are. That real one one trumpet, God speaking, brought forth six seals, and that was the start. Because God was, what did that do? That now is telling the bride a time frame. Without the seals, you don't know the time frame. You know the Lord's coming. Oh my goodness, the Lord's coming. In the, at the turn of the century, the Holy Ghost, well, the Lord's got to be coming soon. They had no under, understanding, no way of knowing. And, they, and in Azusa Street, they weren't playing around with the deep doctrines of the apostles or any deep revelation. They were just enjoying the presence and the power of God that was on ground. But now as we move from 1948, God now brings a cry to wake a people to hear the doctrine of their forefather, not so you can just hear them and then list them. Oh, look, I've, I got the apostles' doctrine. It was made to make you ready for the next stage. And it's the next stage that you and I are living in. But it's going to be done in three parts. And in Matthew, just before, because Jesus is talking about, in Matthew 24, he's talking about learning about the parable of the fig tree and so forth. It's a preamble 
of the time frame that we're living in. And in verse 43, in verse 42, I should say, after he's finishing, he makes a short summary from verse 32 to verse 41. Then he finishes his office and says, Watch therefore, for you know not the hour when your Lord does come. And in the 70s or the 80s, we've looked at that. But the next verse, there is a important few two words. It was there, but it's not as pronounced as it is today. In verse 43 says, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known what watch. Well, why, why do you want to say what watch? I thought there was just one watch. No, the reason he said what watch, because in, in Luke chapter 12, he's going to talk about three watches. Not one, but three. And if the good man in the house had known what watch that the thief would come, he would have watched and not severed his house to be broken. Now here's the whole thing. And each one of those watch. They're not just there to fill space or time in the Word of God. In whatever it was that you find yourself in time in the days of Brother Branham, if the wise were not watching, or supposedly wise not watching, their revelatory house is going to be broken. Because it's watching what the Lord is giving to prepare this bride to finish her with. Then move on to the second watch, which is in the ministry now of an apostolic ministry, Brother Jackson. And the warning is, if you don't watch, the penalty is your house is going to be broken. And what happened in the days of Brother Jackson, in that hour from, 2000, from 1967 to 2004, a lot of the Branham camp did not want to watch. They did what the Pentecostal did, that they, if time was to last long enough, they would slumber and sleep. And if you ask the Pentecostal today, do you have... Fresh revelation. Oh, yeah, we got this and that and the other thing. We got this activity. And this person preached such a good sermon. A good sermon doesn't equate you in time and in revelation. It may be entertaining to your intellect. It may touch you on the heart. If there's something missing in your basic salvation or in those areas, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But as far as God is concerned... You're not moving on. You're starting to fall asleep. And that's why I quote it in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. If we walk in the light as he is in light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins of unbelief. And so for those that were following, let's say, in the Pentecostal church before Brother Branham, because they didn't want to go in there, when God puts the word on ground... The blood doesn't cover them. Their house is going to be broken. They're not going in no rapture. Now bring this further on in the days of Brother Branham. As he comes off the scene, now God brings a furtherance of his word on ground. And he brings that word on ground, I'd have to say to the People in Brother Branham's day, now unless you never heard, then you're not found guilty. But if the word comes to you, and you reject it, then God holds that on you. And so as 
Now the apostle starts preaching things that the prophet didn't preach. And what does the Branham camp do most of the time? God sent a prophet. He, he brought seal, six seals. Well, it's wonderful for the world, the world to know this that never heard it. That's fine. But that's all the crawling. Yes, they get into the doctrines of the apostles and so forth. But as far as God is concerned, spiritually speaking, they have just stayed right there. So, look at it from the point of the rapture. If they're denying or rejecting his word, does apply, but apply for them. First of all, if they were wise virgin, they would move on. It is impossible, though they've been enlightened, or has the born again experience, to be lost. It just shows me most of them were intellectual tares. I came across something that Brother Jackson mentioned. He's talking about, because the things that he had to battle against in his day is the people from the Branham line. He says, how many of you do really do, really do understand now that the fourth and the fifth chapter, he's talking about the book of Revelation, as it was revealed back there in 1963, the knowledge of those seals that are contained therein. Now, Brother Jackson didn't bring that. It was Brother Brown that brought that. Now, here's what he says that he was observing in his day. There is an element of people that has moved forward with that knowledge. That's the people that accepted the message he was preaching. But there's hundreds or many others that have taken that and they sat down. They didn't go any further than what the prophets were saying. And they wait and they wait and they wait. Because they see nothing else that they need to do. In other words, why are they waiting? The Branham people are waiting for the seventh seal to be revealed. Now some of them, yes, there's, there's all kinds of things taking place in the Branham movement. Some say that the seventh seal is in the books, there, so we just got to find it. But that's just fanatical, fanaticalism. But the majority... They're waiting for the Lord to come. They're waiting for that seventh seal. And they can wait till doomsday because they won't know how close they're getting to it than, than a rabbit would. And so therefore, when God did move in an apostle ministry, we sat on that for a long time, almost some 40 years. And I thank God for the things that he brought. But we're not living in that period of time. That's your second watch. We're living in the third one. Because remember in Matthew 24, we just read, watch. Excuse me, I'll just maybe read it properly. If the good man of the house had known what watch, that's the first clue that the thief would come, he would have watched. Brother Jackson never touched three watches. When you're looking at Matthew chapter 10, At, sorry, Matthew 25 and verse 10. In the years that it was preached concerning, and you'll find it in the, uh, the last 100 years, and you probably preached some of it in the seals. But he never did touch. I searched to see if he did. He never touched on Luke chapter 12. Nor did he touch Luke chapter 19, verse, 13, verse 12 to verse 
43. He didn't touch about those coming. He didn't touch Luke chapter 12 because in the days that he was bringing that fresh meat on ground, I don't know if he probably knew or he didn't want to maybe bring it out or the Lord didn't allow him to see it at that hour. But when the Lord would come and serve servants down here, that's what his ministry was. And I'm sure the Branham movement would have said, hey, he's got a big head. He's looking at that revelation and he's saying, that's me there. Now, when the Lord comes to feed servants, it's not during one watch, it's in the three watches. All three watches. That the Lord was going to serve meat. And so therefore, when we look in Luke chapter 12, it talks about Ye liken yourself unto men that wait, that wait for the Lord when he will return. Not when he cometh, when he is returned, that they may open to him immediately. Why? Oh, well, it's not important. We have the doctrines of the apostles and the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's what a Pentecostal will tell you. Or maybe others. Blessed, blessed are those servants when the Lord cometh, shall find watching. They're up to date. And I say to you that he shall gird himself. Now, I read that and this week. I says, well, okay, there's that word gird. What does it really mean? Well, when you look at the definition of gird, which is in the... Lexicon Dictionary, 4824. That's the, sorry. Oops, okay, I guess I can only bring up so far. That is the actual Greek word. It means to fa fasten the garment with a girded belt. That's how you can take it literally. But metaphorically, it talks about being girded with truth or equipped with knowledge of truth. So he girded himself with truth. Oh, but he, Jesus was girded with truth, all truth when he was walking here on earth. He wasn't girded with the fresh revelation. He wasn't girded with 96 AD, what was told John. <coughs> so now, And he was not girded with the doctrines of the apostles. That was already out. So when he says he has come down to serve meat, he's girded with fresh, divine revelation. And he's going to come forth and serve, sit down to meet and serve them. That's happening down here on the earth during those three watches. <coughs> That's why I'd have to say <coughs> Luke chapter 12 it's all these scriptures in Matthew chapter 25 and 10 Luke chapter 12 37 Luke 19 and 13 and even Revelation 1 and 3 all taken place now from 1963 onward. Why? <clears throat> Blessed is he that readeth and understandeth. This book of Revelation. It's God's love letter to her. But when we don't want to know what God's doing of his love letter, <coughs> we're not watching. We're just waiting. And so, blessed he that readeth, that didn't happen in 1947 when the cry was made. Those wise and foolish virgins in from 47 to 1960 could, yes, physically read the book, but they didn't understand 
what was in the book of Revelation. And so therefore, all these scriptures pertain, has its starting point right here in 1963. Now, when I say to the, brought out er, just a bit earlier here, how that the Branham camp, they're not watching for the Lord. They're waiting for the Lord. Or they're observing when the Lord would come. Which is different than watching. Because they have certain revelations in their mind. And they're waiting for it to come to fulfillment. And if it be that it came to the place it came to fulfillment. The fulfillment of those revelations. It's not fresh meat. It was revealed back there. It's just a fulfillment of revelation. Now let's take place in the time of Brother Jackson. He fed us a lot of wonderful, beautiful, divine revelation. But in the movement today, are they watching or are they waiting? They're waiting for the miracle war. They're waiting for the building of the temple. They're waiting for the secret war. And they're waiting for the seventh seal to be broke. And when those events start to take place, is that fresh revelation? No, it's a fulfillment of what's already been revealed. So that makes a person that's only interested and that we're staying in a safe zone. You are only waiting. You're not watching. How many see the difference? But we are watching in this hour. Watching for what? Here's the three watches. First of all, the Jackson movement, the majority don't believe in three watches. Oh, but we have fresh revelation. But they don't name it. Because they don't have it. They have the thing that was revealed back there. Now, I'm saying this this morning to wake up those that would have eyes to see and ears to hear. Because from here on out, God is not going to just wait around and wait around for someone to maybe finally stumble across a revelation and see it. In all those three watches, when fresh revelation came on ground, an element of tares was separated. In the second watch, as fresh revelation came on ground, that those that fall it, it separates some tares from there. Do you think it's different in this hour? But they're good people. They read the Bible. They go to church. But they're watching. They're not watching. They're just waiting. I'm saying this for the aspect, please wake up. Because what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 43, if the good man of the house had known what watch he was in, Where's the danger? It's the watch that you're in that becomes the danger point. And if you're not watching, you're not going to know it now. Not in 2018. But as we get closer to that time frame of that opening of the seventh seal, your house is going to be broken. Because the events on ground will have gone further than what you know now. Just like the Branham camp concerning the message under Brother Jackson. God had went much further with them. Now, did that break up their church and they all dissipated? No, the hunger got lost there. 
Oh, you'll get some energetic, novice preacher to get up there and get excited. But getting excited about a, a particular message is not a fresh revelation. There's a difference between excitement and what revelation does. Because revelation feeds you, whether not just in the time you're in the service, but wherever you're going, that's on your mind. So now we are living in this period of time here. What has God done during this third watch? Did he do anything? He sure did. Does it contradict what was previously brought? No, it cleared up more sight of what's going on. Just as Brother Jackson cleared up more sight of what the Branham camp was doing. So in this is in this hour. Who's doing it? It's the Lord Himself because He wants us to be made ready when He wanted us to go in that made the command to go into that room. In Matthew twenty five, verse ten. It was not going to be done overnight. It's going to be done through three watches. It was not necessary for Brother Bram to know that there was three watches. It was not necessary for Brother Jackson to know that there was three watches. But surely in the last stage, which is the five-fold ministry, they need to know that there was three watches involved in the Lord's coming. That there would be revelation, a little bit more information on His coming as you would get nearer to His coming. Well, praise the Lord. Is that I got the wrong time. Is it twelve o'clock or twelve twelve thirty? Ooh. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so what has brought? Yes, Brother Jackson gave the definition of time and seasons meant centuries and decades. But it's not Brother Jackson that God used to open up when the centuries would end. And it's such a simple scripture that identifies it. Matthew 24, verse 32. When Israel became a nation one day, that generation won't pass away. It ain't going to be another hundred years. There's going to be three watches involved. In when the seventh seal is broke. Now I sort of hear rumors. Well, you know that brother from Canada. He's he's trying to bring things that that uh, what those seven thunders are going to be saying. You're in error. Nobody knows what's in those seven thunders. I do not know. Nobody knows till the time that time arrives. But there's more in after that seventh seal is broke. That's going to transpire. And when that seventh seal is broke, and I haven't heard anything yet. Not that I want to see them go the wrong way and to fight against what truth is, but to open up their eyes. When we come to that time factor, when the seventh seal is broke, as we've seen in previous sermons, how that in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is portrayed in the summary of the Gentile age in chapter 1, and he's not dressed with a girded around the waist like a high priest. It's up the pap, he's got white hair, he's portrayed as judge. So he's been high priest all through love, but now he's judge. Judge for what? Hang a, sh- a shingle? Hey, I'm judge. No. He's going to judge something. Who's he going to be judging? The world? No. He's going to be judging the bride. And that's why, and I know I keep repeating this, but it's just to get the message across. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to judge the dead in Christ and the quick. 
And if this is not a true revelation, then tell me what the quick is. When are they going to be judged? If it's all going to happen in glory and everybody's going to come before Jesus' judgment seat up there, there's no quick in heaven. Period. If you're quick, in, you're quick in when you're alive down here. And we could go into a whole lot of things. Like that great exceeding army. Uh, uh, you name it. God has brought more information. It doesn't destroy what was brought. Because we say there's three watches. Does that destroy the things that Brother Branham said? Or Brother Jackson said? It opens the picture. And the danger is, in this hour, if we are not watching, then your house in time is going to be broken. Because time and events will find you out. I can't hide behind... And I know even in the latter years, Brother Jackson, well, the, the cry and the shout is the same thing. In, think about it. In the time that he was dealing with it, he never touched Luke, chapter 12. The Lord coming to feed meat. He never touched Luke, chapter 19, when the Lord would come and bring pounds. That all has to do in nine, has to do when he brings those pounds is when the Lord comes in 1963. And so therefore, I find no fault him saying they're both in the same. And some will go on the internet and crow, now he's trying to change the revelation. I say there's a tear trying to, that has been sleeping, that has been waiting and not watching. I'm not going to give them any wriggle room. Not in this hour. Because if we're coming to completion, we got to see alike, believe alike, and walk alike. And this whole bride is not going to be put by, together by, well, there's a five-fold ministry. It all belongs to Jesus. Jesus is using that five-fold ministry. It's through the apostate ministry that's going to be, he's going to bring a word through that ministry. It is Jesus bringing the word that's going to put this together. And then like Brother Jackson was saying, what have you done? Why don't you hear what's revealed? He was talking about his day. That's been revealed in this hour. Why do you sit down on the road and wait and wait and wait and wait? Jackson movement, why do you sit in the road and wait and wait and wait and wait? Oh, but we seen, when they get all excited, well, God's working that Jerusalem is a center point. That was revealed when? In the 90s. But the fulfillment of it, yes, it's wonderful that it confirms the revelation of what's revealed. But seeing the event take place is not fresh meat. It's a confirmation of fresh meat that was once delivered. And that fresh carcass is still coming forth in the hour that we live in. And no preacher can go on and say, Oh, well, if we're living in the fresh carcass. I'm just going to study, search, and just come up with some things and the Lord will confirm it. No, he don't. But when condition comes on ground, a certain part of his word has to be brought to clear things up, then he will use that ministry. We've been accused of having, we need a revelation every day. It's been 13 years. There's been no major ones. But God has opened up some things in 13 years. When you go back in 13 years of Brother Jackson's life, hey, there was a lot of things brought there too. Yes, he was over 40 years, which is a whole lot more than what we have here. We're not living in, in the, the peak of it. We're living in the point where he's bringing it to a finish. 
Oh, there's something else too. When it talks about Thessalonians, most of the new writers today, they don't use the word shout. Do you know what they use? Here's one. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of a command. They make a distinction from the cry and command. It is the same Lord that's bringing this about. He's, he's the one that brought the cry. He's the one that's been bringing things through the cry, but that was restorative. But when he's moved on into another area, he wants to use a bit of, to identify that new area. So yes, the cry and the shout is the same spirit which comes from on high. But the function, the cry was when it's for that he's going to come. So you can have some tools, like the Apostles' Doctrine, to be ready for the next stage. But when he is here, he's not saying, well, get your Apostle Doctrine straightened out again because before you can get in here. No, now he's going to be moving. And he gave an ample of time. Now granted, there's p new people that come in and so forth, but he's looking at the overall movement of his spirit, of his word. So when we come now... In 1963, he has come down, not that he is coming. How many sees the difference? Does that destroy Brother Jackson's revelation? Because you'll find in some places where he does say, it's when Brother Brown preached those seals that the shout really started. But then he turns around in another message, the shout and the cry is the same thing. He didn't have the revelation that we see today of Luke chapter 12 and of Luke chapter 19 that sets that in place right over here at that time. He, yes, he, he dealt with the revelation as, as far as Revelation chapter 1. He that hears, blessed he that readeth and hears, when did that start? Don't tell me Brother Jackson said that started in 1947. 1963. Now, there is overlapping. That's why I put down there's a transition of one type of moving of the Spirit to restore versus the prophetic teaching. And the prophetic teaching is going to be done in three watches. You and I understand that today. How wonderful that is. Now Mark says there's four, but he takes it from the beginning of Azusa Street, because there would be four, he talks about four watches, but we're concerned with the three. We're concerned with the last one we're in now, and well, okay. Well, maybe I'll stop there for for this morning. But there would be fresh divine meat in each one of those watches. And when God brings his word on ground, that's why we put that scripture up sometimes. There's no place to hide. If you refuse him, that's speaking from heaven. Now, if you say it's not so, then you don't believe it's coming from heaven. But that don't negate it. Just like when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. If I had not come and spoken to you, you would have no sin. But because he came and spoke to them, their sin remaineth. Now, he, he, he didn't shout that. He didn't have a loudspeaker and a broadcast system that went all over the nation of Israel. He spoke to some that were the headship right there, and that went out from there. The same thing applies in whatever period of time. Because Brother Brown had brought six seals then the denomination had no cloak. Because Brother Jackson brought the brand of whom has no cloak for certain things. And so is it in this hour the same thing.
Well, praise the Lord. So into reviewing it, there's three watches involved. Are you happy? Are you being fed? Well, do you mean you have to have a revelation every Sunday to be fed to keep alive? But if you only had a revelation and it would be 20 years before you have another one, I guarantee you there'd be a lot starting to sleep or go in circles. God brings it when it's needed. Either conditions or the bride needs to be energized because that's her lifeline. Well, uh, let's just stand at this time. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the things you have brought. And I know, Lord, you probably still have more in your word until that time or that seventh seal is broke. And even then, Lord, when that seventh seal is broke, you will have thunders, which we don't know and will only know at that hour. But I'm thankful, Lord, for the things you have brought to us in this time. Now, Lord, I just pray that the words that were spoken, use them as you would see fit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated, have your musicians in case someone still has a need, and then uh, we'll go from there. I'd have to say Brother Governor preached a real good message on this also. I know we touched this in 2008. And in 2008, not to the depth we have today. But Brother Governor preached one in 2017 on, in uh, March 26. The bridegroom cometh. He was spot on. Amen. So I just thought I'd let you know. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment, your need to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your heart's cry.
Praise the Lord. I wasn't there when Brother Jackson first came, but there was a prophecy given to him. His ministry was told you had to go east and not go west. And the first place he came when the prophecy said, go to Moncton and start a church. There's a reason for that. I believe the Lord knew that in time this assembly would be a light that God would use. He didn't pick any other place. This is where his ministry started with those seven things that was that was given him to reveal that really took it off where the contender started from then. I'm thankful for the God servant, but I'm more thankful for his word. It's one thing to respect and to thank God for a servant he's used. But let's respect the Lord for his word. Because that's really where it really counts. Let's just stand at this time. Brother Mike, if you'd dismiss us the word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being able to be in the place for the word. We can worship and hear your word, Lord. We're all very so thankful that you're each down to you such a Lord. Yes. Just as of all these systems and all these, all the nonsense, Lord, you just made it so real to all the years. You made it so sudden for you. I ask that you would protect our brothers, brothers Lord. That you teach us, Lord. And Lord, grant that the little country of Israel, Lord, just comes out on top of everything. Lord, we all. We know what you showed us, Lord. Lord, help us to take it and walk with it. And Lord, if there's any sick and afflicted, you know all about it. Yes. And Lord, only you can heal. We just ask, Lord, that it's all in your world. And Lord, we thank you for the traveling mercies that you do give us on you, Lord. <coughs> I ask that you bless all my brothers and sisters, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Come Monday, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, his, his uh, time as office, if there's a bill being passed, his government can go down Monday, or if it passes, he's good till the next election. So I just pray that God keeps him in there. I mean, I don't know who God's favorite is, but I kind of like him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right.